Um, let's open with prayer. God, thank you for your word and your truth and that you have not left us here with no way of knowing who you are and how you operate. I pray that we would come to a deeper knowledge and appreciation for you in this class. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. <clears throat> okay, let's start out with the, the first page of today's notes, which is a little chart of all the scenes. If you think of this book as a movie, there are, well, I put it in 11 scenes. There's really, you could break those up. Um, it's kind of arbitrary how I arrange them, but um, I arranged them into what I thought were the biggest distinct scenes. And last week we covered the banquet, which was all of chapter one. And who were the two major characters in chapter one? Yeah, yeah, uh, Ahasuerus and Vashti. Um, I actually knew someone named Vashti uh, once. Only one person in my life. Um, and then chapter 2 starts the contest, which is for a replacement for Vashti, a new queen. That's where we're introduced to Esther. <clears throat> That's what we're going to cover today. Um, so we won't talk about that now. And then what's that next scene? Does anyone know? So that's when the king asks his sort of like an advisors. I can't remember. I can't pronounce the guy's name. But he was the one that said that um, uh, all wives should submit to their husbands. And he wanted to make it a king. Oh, yeah. Instead of all the rules. Yeah. They did, yeah. At the end of chapter one, yes. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, but the... It wasn't more though, it. Yeah, Mamukin was the one who made that edict. And then a different advisor s suggests in the second little box... You, you see the, the second box here? Um, so Mamukin suggests the law in chapter 1. Someone else suggests the law that happens in chapter 2. Oh, okay. Um... And then this story here, which I believe is at the end of chapter 2. Um, what do you think? I just put M, but that's, that's not for Mamuk, and that's for Mordecai. Uh, what, does anyone remember what happens? What is that little... It's a, I made it a small box because it's a very short little thing just tucked away. Mordecai over, so overheard the uh, plans. Yes. Uh, yeah, two of the eunuchs were, who guard the doors or whatever were um, planning to assassinate the king, and he overhears that and tells his adopted daughter, gets word to her, she tells the king, some of your guards are going to try to kill you. So he saves the king in that scene. That's just the very end of two. And then... Does anyone remember this section about the rise of Haman? Now, that's three characters. The king, Haman, is the guy in the middle with the, the angry grin on his face, <laughs> and Mordecai. So it involves all three of those characters. Does anyone remember what happens just from previous readings? We're just going through the big picture of the book right now. Mordecai wouldn't bow down. Um, yes. Um, so... Right. Um, that's true. So, <clears throat> um, uh, so what happened in that story with all three of those characters is, or that scene, is Haman gets elevated to a high position in the kingdom. The king makes a law that everybody has to bow down to him. Uh, 
Mordecai, the Jew, will not do it. And Haman gets really angry and decides to commit genocide over it and kill all Jews in the empire, which is essentially every Jew in existence. <clears throat> so that little story there, the rise of Haman, creates the major conflict of this book. If you think of a, you know, every, every story, every TV show has to have a conflict um, to be either overcome or if it's a tragedy, then the conflict overcomes the characters. Um, that's the major conflict of this book is that uh, Haman gets the king to write a decree saying on such and such a day it's legal to murder all Jews. Um, can you imagine if we had a law like that in America? One day, Congress announces that um, on December 2nd of this year, it is legal to murder anyone who is Irish and take their stuff. Um, yeah. It would be staggering. And that's how the population reacted to that. Does that mean that this kind of thing can happen now? It's happening with Muslims and Islam, you know, the radical Muslims killing believers, Christians on the side? Uh, yes. Right yes, it does. It's hard for us in America to comprehend that in any kind of real way. It's just so different from our life. Okay, then there's another little story. Oh, sorry. Um, I already covered that next box. The Edict to Kill the Jews. Um, but uh, I wasn't sure to make this a separate episode or not, but I included it. Mordecai and Esther's reaction to the edict when they hear about it. Does anyone remember how they react? See that at the bottom of that, that uh, fifth box yeah. on the left? Which chapter is it? Uh, that would be chapter... The yeah. end. That's four. Mordecai, Darth Ball, Yeah. Mm -hmm. tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. Now, we don't need to get all the details. We're just going over the whole book, and then we're going to focus today on chapter 2, oh, okay. um, which is the contest. But I just want to get the big picture of the book in your minds, and we're going to keep coming back to this. And hopefully, I put images there to help you remember. Oh, yeah, I remember the day we talked about the banquet and Vashti. Okay, it'll help you keep everything straight. So that's why we're going over this. Um, yeah, so does anyone remember the general gist of... The, the word in the Bible they use is distressed. They were distressed, they were distressed yeah. Something of an understatement. Yeah. Um, and they're all fasting and weeping and wailing and tearing their clothes and wearing sackcloth and putting ashes on their, themselves, which I... To me, that's putting ashes on my body is not like... A sign of sadness to me, but apparently it was then. Um, uh, okay, so then Esther finds out. Also, Mordecai lets her know this is what's happening. Um, and what does Mordecai communicate to her? They're talking back and forth about this deal. What does Mordecai tell Esther? Go talk to the king. Yeah, go talk to the king. And then she's, well, she, they're sending these messengers back and forth. Um, because he's wearing sackcloth and you're not allowed to come near the king's quarters when you're wearing that. Well, yes. First, she says, well, I can't go in there because it's illegal. It's death penalty if you just like waltz into the Oval Office. It's not an Oval Office, but it's the cultural equivalent. Um, 
And he's like, well, you got to do it anyway. And so she says, okay, well, um, let's fast for three days, get all the Jews to fast for three days, and then I'll do it. And if I perish, I perish. So she goes in, and then the king's like, what do you want? He doesn't say it like that. But he's like, well, what would you like? You can have anything. And she says, what? Uh, that's not what she says. That is probably what she wants, but that's not what she says. I can't remember, but it was not in his favor. Yeah, but what she says is, I would like you and Haman to come to a banquet I've prepared. Okay. And he's like, okay, um, probably you want something else too, but I'll come to your banquet. Um, and they have the banquet, and it's just the three of them. Uh, Esther, Ahasuerus, and Haman. And then there's a little scene with Haman and his wife where he's bragging about how great he is. Um, and he's still mad at Mordecai. Um, and, you know, uh, it got deleted off of this chart here, but that's the scene, that little one with Haman and his wife is the scene where he builds the big spike, which you can see gets used later in the book on the right. But um, I had just an empty spike there by that picture of him and his wife it gets built there um, and then is the great reversal scene um, the, the center of the book the most exciting thing in the book when everything gets turned upside down because um, can anyone give us a general gist? It starts out with the king not being able to sleep that night. Anyone remember that story? Chapter 6? Yeah, and they read to him. Yeah, they read. He's like, I can't sleep. Read to me. Something boring. Something really boring is the histories of the annals of the king, right? And so it's going to be stuff like, on this day you made this law saying that this tax would be levied on this country. And, and what passage of the history does happen to does he happen to be read? The, the, the scribe happens to read to him that night in the Great Reversal. Does anyone remember? About Mordecai. It's the time that Mordecai saved his life back in chapter three or the end of two. Um, and so the king says, "What?" to the attendant. Anyone remember? Did he ask him if they had done anything for Yeah, he's like, what, how do we reward him? And they said, we didn't do anything for him. And he's like, mm, I need to reward him. Who's here? And who happens to be coming in early in the morning while it's still dark? Happens to be Haman on his way to say, can I put Mordecai on a big spike that I made? Um, so he gets there, and the king says what to him? What should I do for someone I really want to honor? And what does Haman, the villain of the story, what does he think when the king asks him that? It's the only time we're told someone's thoughts. He thinks he's going to be the one that gets honored. It's very rare in the Bible at all to hear someone's thoughts, especially in this story. We talked about that last week. That she, we hear what she does, we don't know why. We're almost never told why characters do what they do. Uh, one time here we hear someone's thoughts and he thinks, it's going to be me. He's going to honor me. So he describes leading this guy around on the king's horse, wearing the king's robes, and proclaiming to everyone, this is a man the king wants to honor. And what does the king say to him? He says, go do that for Mordecai the Jew. Um, so, in light of that, he doesn't mention the spike that he has made to the king. And he has to do it. And so you can see that um, I tried to draw, have somebody, more, uh, Haman there, with his head hung down. He's not real happy about his job, but he has to do it. Um, and then he runs back home to his wife 
and tells them he's humiliated what happened, um, that he had to honor Mordecai. And what do they say? This time, last time he was bragging about how great he is. This time they say, you are so toast. <laughs> You would think they'd be like, well, I, I know this is hard, but it's okay. You're still really important. They're like, no. Phew. This is the guy you were trying to kill. You're trying to wipe, you already made a law saying to wipe out his people. And this happens. You're not going to make it. This is bad. This is a bad omen. Um, omens were much, a much bigger deal in ancient times. Okay. And then, um, by the way, at the first banquet, the king said, okay, what do you really want? And she says, I want you to come to my second banquet. And so right after he's talking to his wife and family, the eunuchs arrive and they're like, come on, come on, it's time for the second banquet. And what happens at this banquet? Donna, this is what you were saying. This is where the king asked her what she would like to have. And she tells them. And she says, I want to live and let my people live. Because, very kind. She said, if I've been favored in your son. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's very important. And when we cover that chapter, we'll go into depth about her politeness and, and tact. Um, she says, We'd like to, I'd like my people to live. Someone's trying to kill us. And he says, who is it? And she says, it's him. Um, and the king is really mad, and one of the servants says, by the way, king, there happens to be a 75-foot-tall spike, sometimes translated gallows, but historically they didn't have gallows. It would have been a spike. Um, at this guy's house. And the king says, put him on it. And so I don't know that that drawing is how they put them on it. Um, there are some actual carvings we found of people on those spikes. I should study those and find out the manner. I don't know if they did it through their back or what. Either way, it's not a good thing to happen. If they're having volunteers, I would not raise my hand for that one. Then she goes to the king again and says, can you please change this law? And, of course, the laws in this particular time couldn't be changed but they can be added to. So, um, so Mordecai gets the king's signet ring. Anyone know what that is? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's essentially a, our modern day signature. Um, you can dip it in wax and it makes it officially from the king. Because the kings were illiterate. So they were not signing their names or anything. Um, uh, and so Mordecai makes a new edict. It doesn't change the fact that it's legal to kill Jews on that day, but it makes it legal for the Jews to defend themselves on that day. So it adds to it. And the Jews' reaction to that is very happy. And Mordecai gets elevated, the rise of Mordecai. And Haman gets killed and his ten sons. And does anyone know what Purim is? Purim. The Jewish holiday. And what is it? Like Christmas celebrates Jesus' birth. What does Purim celebrate? Well, yeah, but what is it commemorating? The story. Yeah, it's commemorating the time when they were delivered from extinction as a race through this story. So, um, of course, this story was written after the events took place. The events happen, then someone writes them down, right? It's not like videotaping it while it's happening. So, People had already been celebrating Purim, Purim, when the book is written, and the book says, 
here's how this holiday got started, right? Um, it would be like, um, let's assume there's no history books at all. Somebody would think, in a couple generations, people are going to say, what is Martin Luther King Day? Why is that a holiday? Right? And if nothing is written down or recorded, no one would know. Am I right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So someone thinks, let while we still remember, while we still know, even if it didn't happen in our lifetime, our parents told us about it. Let's write down the story to tell them what happened and what he accomplished as for civil rights, um, which is Monday, right? Um, so that's what sort of what this book is about in a way. Part of its purpose is to say, here's how Purim got started. Um, so that's that little section about that. And then it ends with the greatness of Mordecai and how all the great stuff he did. He's like essentially the prime minister. He's not the king, but he's kind of number two guy. She's, yeah, she's still the queen, but, um, yeah, um, in my opinion, the book's much more about Mordecai than Esther, um, and we'll get to all that. Not that she's not important, um, but remember, we're trying to not assume that because it's in the Bible, the characters are moral examples, Right? Like, even in the New Testament, um, like, Peter wrote a book of the Bible. He was a pretty important guy. But how do we know when to imitate Peter and when to not be like Peter? Because there's certain times um, when Peter does things that were bad, and Jesus rebukes him. And there's other times after, then Paul rebukes him. Remember that in Galatians? Paul stands up in front of everybody and says, if you, are like a Jew, you who are a Jew, live like the Gentiles, then why are you trying to compel Gentiles to live like Jews? Um, he says, he, Peter was leading everyone, even Barnabas, into hypocrisy. And Paul confronts him publicly, and Peter's like, you're right. So, um, anyway, um, just because a character is in the Bible doesn't mean they're a, a paradigm of virtue. In fact, very few characters are. Um, well, they're human like us now. Yeah. Yes. They're simple. Yes. Um, and I think we're going to find out that um, today that Esther and Mordecai are not ideal people to imitate. So, that's the overview of the whole book. Let's dive into chapter 2. Any thoughts or questions before we start that? Chapter 2? Okay, well, if you think of it later. Oh... Uh, one through four. Lynn, would you like to read? Oh, sorry, you just took a bite. Anyone else? Sorry. Like to read? I'll read. Okay, one, verses one through four of chapter two. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended me said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all provinces of the kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, 
the king's unit, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given him. Then let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Ashby. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. Okay. How old were these young ladies? Um, About 18, 19, 20, or even younger? Probably younger. Um, probably... 14. Um, it didn't really matter as long as they were virgins and they were beautiful. Um, if there was a 20-year-old virgin who was beautiful, it's just the odds of that happening um, are slim, you know, because um, she probably already would have been married if she was beautiful and 20 years old. Um, so yeah, yeah, we're talking like, ju like they have to have hit puberty, um, or they're not at a marriable age, so, you know, um, young, and then, um, uh, so yeah, so what basically happened there in verses one through four? Anyone sum that up? A beauty pageant. A beauty pageant, yes. Except um, the winner becomes the queen, mm -hmm. and all the non-winners become what? Um, they become part of the harem. Of the harem. Yeah. 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 So um, a harem is just a bunch of women that the king can, if he wants, call for them for that night. So he has a special part of the palace, with all the women, all the, all the, not just women, uh, all of his harem, and if he um, wants to sleep with a particular one, if he can remember her name, then she'll come that night. Um, um, yeah, so, um, uh, let's just take it a little bit at a time. It starts out, he remembers Vashti. She was so pretty. She was very beautiful. And um, it doesn't say he's sad about it, but you kind of get that vibe. Um, he's remembering her and what he decreed about her. And then what happens in verse 2? It just says he's remembering her. It doesn't say that he says anything. Verse 2 of chapter 2, Then the king's personal attendants proposed, Let's let a search be made. You are the king of the whole known world. Let's go to every province and get all the most beautiful girls and bring them here. They're still winning the show, so to speak. Yeah. Um, he's not making any decisions. Giving yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. How does he come across? Uh, let's I mean, take three possible, um, three questions. Does he come across as, don't answer him yet, but does he come across as proactive or reactive? Number one. Does he come across as decisive or indecisive? Does he come across as a leader or a follower? He wasn't proactive. He's not proactive, yeah. And he's more of a follower. More of a follower. Um, what was the second one? Decisive or indecisive? But what does indecisive mean? He, he can't make up his mind. He can't. So he goes back and forth and deliberates between two options? Do, does he do that, though? He lets them decide. Yeah, yeah he, he's dependent on them totally, it seems like. Uh, yes, that's the follower one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But think about decisive and indecisive. Dis indecisive means, um, would be... Yeah, let me follow that advice. You know what? No, no, no. That's not good advice. Um, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, that's not what he does, is it? 
It's a, it, it seems like reactive, follower, it feels like that would go along with indecisive. But it doesn't in this case. Chris pleased the king and he did it. He did so. We're doing it. Make a decree. That happened last chapter, didn't it? He's super mad. What should I do about this? Why don't you make a law that she's banished and all women, all men have to be master in their own homes for the whole kingdom. Make a law for millions of people. Let's do it. It's done. Here, stamping it with my ring. So he's both decisive. Decisive is not a great word. Maybe rash is a better word. Maybe capricious. He just does stuff that doesn't seem to be thought through very well and is other people's ideas twice now. Um, so it's becoming a pattern in the book of how the king makes decisions that are going to affect millions of people. How many young ladies, young girls, become part of the harem? One hundred? Just a guess. Anybody else have a guess? Let's see what it said. Let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem. How many provinces are there? According to verse 1 of chapter 1? 127 provinces. So a commissioner in every province, and that his job is to bring... Now, it is possible that his job is just to find the single most beautiful girl in his province. I highly doubt that that's what that's saying. I think his job was to go from town to town and at least get the most beautiful girl in every town. At least. So, this means, this is, it, says, it just says many later in the chapter. Um, but that means this is a minimum of 127 girls, which is a lot of people. Um, I mean, that's like the whole junior high at my kids, my girls' school. More than that, really. It's, it's, not, it's a small school. Um, a minimum of 127 to a maximum of 3,000. Um, depending on how you do the math, as to how long it takes, there's... Um, it could be up to that many. Uh, seems unlikely that it's that high. But regardless, it's a lot. It's a lot of young ladies. And um, they're going to be in the care of who? Hey guy, who's the king's eunuch who's in charge. And... Um, of the harem. You have to have uh, a eunuch. Uh, you have to have eunuchs who are in charge of your harem and who are the servants and all the things, the guards. Everyone who's in any way associated with the harem has to be castrated, every man, um, because the king can't have any possibility of someone. Uh, desiring one of his women, even if he doesn't particularly even remember who they are. Can I just ask a question yes. about that? These young girls that they're bringing in, it, was that an honor 
for them to do that, I mean, but to, I mean, they're being taken away from their families, mm-hmm. their home, for forever. I mean, they're not they're not going to be returning most likely. They're going yes. To be okay. So everyone they know and love is gone. They, most of them, the vast majority of them, spend one night with the king um, and then go to become part of the harem and never see the king again. And they never have a chance to have a husband. They can never have children. The vast majority of them. It is very rare um, to get pregnant all in one night of your life. But it does happen. But the vast majority of them will never have children, will never have a husband that they can talk to, will never have family. They're essentially confined to widowhood from, from age 14. And some widows have children which is better, and some widows have friends and relatives around them. So, for most of these girls, it ruins their life. And think about how many attendants there would have to be. There's got to be food brought in. There's got to be guards at every gate. Um, And it's eunuchs who are doing all this. Uh, Herodotus, the Greek historian, from the 400s BC, says that the Persian kings at this time rounded up 500 boys every year and castrated them and brought them into the service of the king as eunuchs for the rest of their life. So, after, I mean, after you know, a couple generations, how many eunuchs do you have working for the palace? Thousands of these guards um, who are in very much the same situation as those girls. They can never have children. They can never have children. They can, they're taken away from their families. Um, and their job is just to serve the king because he has to be very protective of what's his. It's a, it's a person who has absolute power. It's a picture of uh, what it's like when people get power. Now, when you have a little bit of power, like say, you're in charge of the church library. You don't go that crazy. But you it always it's so sad. It always does a little something to you. And you have power. Uh, I noticed that as a teacher that something was happening to me just because I was in charge for you know, six hours a day, I was in charge of everyone I could see. And then during lunch, you know, there'd be other teachers and I'm not in charge of them. But most of the day, I was in charge. And after one year, my personality had changed a little bit. And not for the better. I don't know how to stop that from happening. But it's just the, it's just the, plain facts of life. And when you have this much power over the whole world, um, it, um, it, anything you want, it doesn't matter whose life it ruins. You just do it. Just stamp it. Let it be done. Yes. Um, yeah, um, well, that would be, uh, they would be part of the, um, the court. The king's court. They would grow up and, yeah, um, they would be, have a good chance at having an important position. A boy would. Um, 
since his father is the king. He would, I mean, he could, he could be a contender for the throne if his mother was a favorite. But the vast majority of them were not. It says specifically, unless he called for him by name, they never saw the king again. Um, so um, Vashti, as a character, kind of foreshadows all these girls, right? The king uses her for her beauty and then banishes her from his sight. And that's what happens every night. He uses one of these girls for her beauty and then... But you're mine. And no one else can have you or be near you. But I don't really need you because I found someone prettier than you. Um, it's a shocking story. It's not like the PG movie versions that we see at all. It's horrible. Okay. Uh, we better move on. We're not going to get very far in chapter 2. Uh, 5 through 7. Lynn, can you read this one? Verses 5 through 7. Yeah. Uh, now there was in the citadel of Susa a, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Sheman, the, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with um, Jehoiachin. Okay, thank you, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. The girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Okay, so we're introduced to two more main characters here. Um, so what do we know about them from that? Anything? They're both Jews. Okay, good. They're both Jews. What else? From what tribe of Israel? Benjamin. Benjamin, yeah. From what clan? Um, same clan as King Saul, right? Kish? Remember King Saul long, long ago? Because here's the kingdom. That's the, on the last page. Uh, the kings, it started out, the first king was Saul. And he was the, from the tribe of Benjamin, but he disqualifies himself. Uh, and so then David becomes the new king. And he's from a different tribe. He's from the tribe of Judah. And then his son, he starts a dynasty, Solomon. And Solomon's sons and David's great-grandsons go all the way to Jehoi... I don't know how to spell it. Jehoiachin. Who's to this last king, this great-great-great-great-great-grandson of David, gets taken into exile. And the whole nation, too. So there's the exile. Um, and then in the post-exile, when some of the Jews return, some stay. And so the, out of this group that got captured with Jehoiachin, uh, somebody who was in the same tribe as the original king this guy was a diff totally different tribe from David and all the kings. But somebody, Saul's father's name was Kish, um, somebody was taken there and his name is Mordecai. So he didn't go back when they went back. He stayed over in Persia. And so Mordecai is living there and he has a, a cousin that he's raising as a daughter, an adopted daughter. Um, if you can't follow all that, that's okay. Uh, we'll reinforce it later. It is going to become important for the story. <clears throat> Here's a question. Why... Um, well, no, I won't ask that. We'll wait on that. Um, okay, let's move on. Eight and nine. Anyone want to read those? 
came to pass from the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together in Shushan, the palace to the captain of Tugai, that Esther was brought also into the king's house to the captain of Tugai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of them, and he speedily gave her her things for purification, the substance that belonged to her, and seven maidens which were meet to be given her, out of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maids in the best place of the house of the women. So Haggai, house of the women is the harem quarters. Haggai really likes this girl. Um, of course, he's a eunuch, so it just means he, you know, he likes her in a platonic way. Um, and he gives her the best place. He gives her some servants to attend to her. Um, immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments, and he says, and special food. Okay. Um, and let's read 10 and 11 also. Anyone want to read verses 10 and 11 from chapter 2? Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Okay. So, some questions. Um, why did uh, Mordecai allow her to be taken for this harem thing. He knew... He listen to her. What? The king would listen to her. The king would listen to her? So you... So, she was a, she was a queen. so you think he thought, if she wins this thing, that's going to be politically advantageous for me. For, for the Jewish people. For the Jewish people. So it was to protect his people. Maybe he thought that she was more beautiful than the other girls. Maybe he did, yeah. You tend to be blind with your own family. She was certainly better off, you know, and she would have been So she was better off to marry an uncircumcised pagan oh. and live in a palace. <laughs> you might have thought it was a little bit self-serving, too, because her parents were dead and he had taken her as a daughter, so there would be that. He wouldn't have to take care of her anymore? Yeah. No, not necessarily. I was thinking more in terms of... Uh, she would oh, he a, would get political... He does have some kind of position. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does end up making him politically very powerful in the end. Um, I noted that uh, if she pleased, he got points of God for racial control. Uh, yes, yes, that's true. Uh, the fact that, that she finds favor in Haggai's eyes does point to God's providential control. But, I mean, if my daughter was going to be taken um, to, to be used by the president, of the United States, I, especially if um, it was going to be in some kind of sick situation like what we have here, and she's going to be violating the Torah by marrying a pagan, uncircumcised pagan, and eating their food which she does, and unlike Daniel, she doesn't say, no, I don't want to eat that. She just eats it. Maybe he was using Esther. Mordecai? Um, if he thought, looked at her as a daughter, I mean, what father would want to give you all of But he knew that maybe she could gain favor with the king, which is good for the Jews. So, basically, he was just taking advantage of the situation. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a possibility. Um, obviously, you're not... Mm, 
you're probably not allowed to resist. So he might have been facing death or uh, a life as a fugitive if he, you know, hides her the way Moses was hidden from the Egyptians. Um, Did they have a choice? If they came and rounded up these They girls? probably didn't have a choice legally, but you have a choice to run away yeah. and live in the desert. You have that choice. Was it just being fatherly to make sure that it was still okay? When? when? As this pacing back. The pacing back and forth, yes. Yeah, but we're just, right now we're just talking about why he lets her participate at all, why he lets her be taken into this harem. Well, it doesn't say that God talked to him or anything about God, yeah. but I just wondered if God didn't say something to him or something about that he would be taken. Yeah, but yes, it, does, it doesn't say. It's just left. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very important, that fact. Yeah. Again, remember last week, uh, in his book, God is never mentioned. So God is almost assumed to be the cause of what Mordecai was doing. Um, yes, I agree with you, but I would say, I would not use the word assumed. I would say, if you're reading this book, this book is hot off the press, it's written, and your synagogue gets a copy of it, and you're reading it, and reading it, and pondering it, and pondering it for years, for a lifetime. That's the way these books were intended. They didn't have, like, I'm reading, like, you know, fiction, like, you know, thousands of pages a year just for fun. It wasn't like that. You had a very few books for your life. Over the course of a life, Dean, of reading this book and pondering this book while you're sitting at your pottery thing for hours every day, or behind your plow for hours every day thinking about the book, you're going to come to that conclusion. I don't think you come to that conclusion like that. No, you no. don't. I wouldn't come to it if I'm making this first class. Right, <laughs> yes. What about the fact that she didn't look like a dude? And she did for Yeah, there's several factors involved. One, this is a multi-cultural situation going on. Everyone looks different. Two, she's probably, well, she is hiding her ethnic identity. So she's eating the food they all eat, which is violating the Bible, you know, to eat those foods. Um, she's dressing at least enough like the other girls that it doesn't draw attention. Like, you must be some, we're all different races, but you must be some weird race that doesn't, right? Why does he say, don't tell you're a Jew? You're not allowed. Well, maybe she thought he had more experience of what was going on, so she would listen to him. But why does he tell her that? So you read Mordecai as kind of like not a good person. I mean, that... I mean, it, it definitely could be because it doesn't say. What were you going to say? He's a clever politician. Yeah. You know, Mordecai wanted freedom for the Jews, and that's what he was doing. And he did what he had to do to get that yeah. done. He was using all the tools using, that he had. Yeah. So he was just a brilliant politician. And using, yeah, and using that's the, how I, I'm not saying I know. Or, you know. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. Well, when you say freedom for the Jews, um, Freedom to do what? They weren't they free? <laughs> and they, they weren't free, like they didn't have any political authority, um, and they definitely had enemies. There's definitely anti-Semitism going on. I mean, not just Haman. It's definitely going on. We'll find out later in the book. Um, they definitely have enemies. Of course, in the ancient times, like people had real enemies. Like, I had, like, an enemy in school because, like, he would, like, you know, maybe, like, push me down in the locker room once a month. 
and then people would laugh and that was it. Like, and that went on like for a couple months and then it just kind of fizzled out. And it's not really an enemy. I mean, that's kind of like just some little thing. Uh, I barely remember his name. Like, back then it was like people trying to kill you and your family to get possession of your stuff and if they can find a way so that your body never gets buried to add insult to injury or death, then that'd be a better for them. You see what I'm saying? Like, in our culture, nobody's like cursing your descendants for all time. You know? But back then, it was, it was a violent, aggressive world where people had real enemies. I think he's looking at big picture. If she got in there, then she had, had, she was at somebody standing up for her. Like, it ended up doing that when she told him about uh, him and stuff. I, I think he was looking at, oh, think, think about all the Jews, the big picture, might have some pull with her in there. Yeah. You're right, and it could be. Um, I just can't imagine it. I mean, he obviously cares about her. He's pacing back and forth every day, checking on her. Which brings up another question. Um, uh, does he have any of his own children? It doesn't say. But when he's elevated to like, the highest position in the land other than the king. It doesn't say anything about a wife. It talks about Haman's wife and how many sons Haman has, ten. It doesn't say anything about Mordecai's wife. It doesn't say anything about Mordecai having kids. He's got this one adopted daughter. That's his cousin. Um... What? Go ahead. Because he has continuing the line of his family. What do you mean? She could have been pregnant by the king or something like that. Or he would have. He would live on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a factor, but I think that she has a much better chance of having children if she marries someone other than the king. That's true. Because there's, I mean, it's like one in a hundred shot or one in three thousand shot mm -hmm. that she's going to actually end up marrying the king as an official wife and not just a concubine. Um, and sh if she's that beautiful, she's definitely going to have suitors. And they would be Jewish, which is every Jew wants she their children to marry. Get out, though, but she, she would become part of the harem. No, no, I'm saying if he doesn't let her participate at all. Oh, okay. Um, but if you're saying um, why, he's, why he's pacing back and forth, that's what... He, I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. I have no clue how to okay. explain that. <laughs> yeah. It just kind of popped in there, but I, I don't know how to explain um, that. Now. Well, um, this is one of the clues in the book. Um to hint at the fact that Mordecai might be a eunuch. And so that's why he has no kids of his own. And that's why he's so concerned about his, the closest thing to a daughter that he has. Um, there's other clues also. The fact that he can get close enough to the harem yeah. to communicate with her. I was wondering how he could be there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The fact that he can get that close uh, is another clue because they obviously, these kings, were very protective. And there's all kinds of eunuchs in this story. Um, like, I would like to take the whole Bible and average, I mean, and know how many times the word eunuch is used and what percentage of that is in this book. It'd be a high percentage. Um, 
Uh, and that's going to become a huge thing, especially, like I said, if, in my opinion, Mordecai is the main character, not Esther. Uh, Mordecai and the king definitely get way more screen time in this, if this were a movie. So we're out of time, um, but there's lots of questions that make you make you wonder: Are these even good role models? Because so far, nothing they've done is good morally. She's beautiful, but that's not a moral thing. Um, Um, it tells you something. Um, after she's out from under his parental authority, she's the queen now, she's still obeying him. So what does that tell you about the way he was, the way he exercised his authority over his adopted daughter? If someone is mean and domineering and controlling, when you get out from under them, you're gone. But if someone has some kind of authority we don't know, and they get out and they still seek advice and seek to obey, that tells you something about the way they parented. Right? So, that gives us a little clue as to the kind of father he was to her. It doesn't seem to be the man manipulative type who's seeking only his own advantage. Um, yeah, so, and then you have all these questions of why is he telling her to hide her national identity? Why does he let her? Is it just that he's scared? If I try to hide her, I'm going to get killed. I'm going to get put on a big spike. Well, I don't think she'd have got in there to the king if they knew she's Jewish. Maybe there is some anti-Semitism. That's a big debated point because the king doesn't seem to care. He's getting girls from every single province in the world other than Greece because it's the only place he can't take over. The By the way, between chapters 1 and 2, he had another failed expedition into Greece. Can you give him permission to kill Jews on a certain day? So I can't see that he really loved the Jews. Um, yeah, we're going to have to talk about how Haman manipulates him into making that law. We need to get out of here because this classroom is going to be used in 20 minutes. But um, there's so many questions, and some of them will get answered throughout the course of the book, and some of them won't. Um, some of them will only be hinted at. Uh, and they're all important. And they're left, it's not just like, well, we just don't know. Well, they're left ambiguous, they're left unknown for a reason, to make us ask those questions and think about it. So, next week we'll try to finish chapter two. Okay, I will.